A building has 100 floors. One of the floors is the highest floor an egg can be dropped from without breaking. If an egg is dropped from above that floor, it will break. If it is dropped from that floor or below, it will be completely undamaged and you can drop the egg again. There are two eggs given. Find the highest floor an egg can be dropped from without breaking with as few drops as possible. So let me repeat the puzzle. A building has 100 floors. One of the floors is the highest floor an egg can be dropped from without breaking. If an egg is dropped from above that floor, it will break. If it dropped from that floor or below, it will be completely undamaged and you can drop the egg again. So there are two eggs given and you are supposed to find the highest floor an egg can be dropped from without breaking. And the important task is you have to find it with as few drops as possible. Let me explain the solution now. We can assume the X break at the same floor and what we are looking for is the next floor down. Our highest non-breaking floor be in. We can also assume once an egg is broken, it's gone forever. Some solutions are pretty simple. If you don't care about how many tries it takes, you can just start dropping eggs on floor 1 and go up until you have reached the correct floor. Floor by floor would get it done, but in our worst case scenario, the egg breaks at floor 100. This means that linearly, our worst case is 100 drops to find our nth floor. To simplify, this is called brute force logic. In this approach, start from ground floor and keep going up until the egg breaks at floor X. Solution is very inefficient in case the egg doesn't break till the 99th floor. Remember, you need to minimize the number of drops in the worst case. The next approach will be binary search approach. My first thought is that we can immediately rule out binary search because we only have the two X. With a binary search strategy, we would start with floor 50 and drop the egg from the 50th floor. If the egg breaks, we know our N is below 50. If it's intact, the floor we want is above 50. Suppose the egg breaks. The problem here is now we have lost an egg and only narrowed down our search by 50 numbers. The next step would normally be to split that 50 again and dropping the egg at floor 25th. But if it breaks, we still haven't found our floor. If it doesn't, we have only delayed the inevitable by one more step and still no solution. The worst case scenario, we have to drop our eggs 50 times. So anyway, this binary search is not going to help in this case. Next approach will be uh, divide a little, conquer a bit. The next solution takes a little bit of the linear approach and mixes in a little of the splitting from our binary approach. We can start off by dropping an egg at floor 10, increasing the drop floor by 10 at a time. Then going back to drop one floor at a time until we find that n. So according to this approach, start from the 10th floor and go up to floors in multiples of 10. If our egg breaks at floor 10, we know n is one of the 9 floors below us. If first egg breaks, say at 20th floor, then you can check all the floors between 11th and 19th with the second egg to see which floor it will not break. If first egg breaks at 30th floor, then you can check all the floors between 21st and 29th with a second egg to see which floor it will not break. In this case, the worst case, number of drops is 19. If the threshold was 99th floor, then you would have to drop the first egg 10 times and the second egg 9 times in linear fashion. Seems relatively straightforward but we can still improve our number of drops. So in this approach, worst case, the egg drops and doesn't break until floor 100, that is 10 drops, and we drop the second egg but don't break it for floors 91 to 99. It brings our worst case drop count to 19 drops. So this is improvised solution, but not the best solution. So now let's get into the best solution. 
the next approach can reduce our worst case scenarios by balancing the linear drops and our 10 floor drop increment. If getting to the higher floors means more drops overall, we need to decrease the drops we need to perform linearly. We are essentially trying to make all possible scenarios and take the same number of drops to solve. We need to minimize this worst case number of drops. For that, we need to generalize the problem to have n floors. What would be the step value for the first egg? Would it still be 10? Suppose we have 200 floors, would the step value be still 10? So let's understand this in detail. The point to note here is that we are trying to minimize the worst case number of drops which happens if the threshold is at the highest floors. So our steps should be of some value which reduces the number of drops of the first egg. Let's assume we take some step value x initially if every subsequent step is x minus 1. If we drop our first egg from floor x, 10 in our 10 floor strategy, the linear portion of our strategy is x minus 1, that is 9 in the above strategy. So our drop count is x plus x minus 1. If the egg doesn't break on the first drop, our drop count increases by 1. So we will need to remove a drop from our floor to floor drop count. The next drop should be from x minus 1 floors up. Every additional floor jump will need to have one less floor. So that when we get the linear portion of the solution, we will have one less floor to check. We continue removing one floor until we only have one floor to check. So the expression becomes x plus x minus 1 plus x minus 2 plus x minus 3 till plus 1. So this is nothing but the sum of n natural numbers and it can be calculated using the formula x times x plus 1 divided by 2. Because there are 100 floors in our problem, we solve for x when the entire summation is equal to 100. Now solve for x. When the number of floors are different, we have to evaluate the expression for the different value. So in this case, x times x plus 1 divided by 2 equals 100. So after solving this equation, we get x equals 13.651. This means we want to start dropping from floor 14, jump up 13 floors to drop from floor 27, jump up 12 floors to drop from floor 39 and so on. So our worst case scenario is then a drop count total of 14. Let me explain this in detail. So follow the following sequence. First drop from floor 14. If it breaks, sequentially check previous 13 floors. Maximum drops required here is 14. Hence drop from floor 27 because 14 plus 13 equals 27. This is by the logic x plus x minus 1 plus x minus 2. So we are decreasing one floor in every step. So if it breaks sequentially, check previous 12 floors that is from 26th to 15th floors. Else drop from floor 39 because 27 plus 12 equals 39. If breaks, check previous 11. Else drop from floor 50 because 39 plus 11 equals 50. If breaks, check previous 10. Else drop from floor 60. If breaks, checks previous 9. Else drop from floor 69. If breaks, checks previous 8. Else Drop from floor 77, if breaks, check previous 7, else drop from floor 84, if breaks, check previous 6, else drop from floor 90, if breaks, check previous 5, else drop from floor 95, if breaks, check previous 4, else drop from floor 99, if breaks, check previous 3, else 100 is the answer. So the total number of steps required in this case is 14. And this is the most optimal solution for this particular problem. Hundred prisoners in jail are standing in a queue facing in one direction. Each prisoner is wearing a hat of color either blue or red. A prisoner can see hats of all prisoners in front of him in the queue but cannot see his hat and hats of prisoners standing behind him. The jailer is going to ask 
color of each prisoner's hat starting from the last prisoner in the queue if a prisoner tells the correct color then is saved otherwise executed how many prisoners can be saved at most if they are allowed to discuss a strategy before the jailer starts asking colors of their hats so i will repeat the puzzle 100 prisoners in jail are standing in a queue facing in one direction each prisoner is wearing a hat of color either blue or red a prisoner can see hats of all prisoners in front of him in the queue but cannot see his hat and hats of prisoners standing behind him the jailer is going to ask color of each prisoner's hat starting from the last prisoner in queue if a prisoner tells the correct color then is saved otherwise executed how many prisoners can be saved at most if they are allowed to discuss a strategy before the jailer starts asking colors of their hats Let me explain the solution now. This puzzle appears in a book called Are You Smart Enough to Work at Google? Quite incredibly, in February 2016, it seems to have been solved by Google's own artificial intelligence program. The solution to this puzzle is, at most 99 prisoners can be saved and the 100 prisoner has 50-50 chances of being executed. So how? So let me explain the solution in step by step. The person at the back, let's call him person number 100, will agree that if he sees an odd number of red hats, he calls out red. If he sees an even number of red hats, he calls out blue. Obviously, any similar scheme would work, but we will use this particular one. Unfortunately, this means he has a 50% chance of survival, but it guarantees everyone else. This is because he himself, that is 100th person, himself not aware of the color of the hat he is wearing, hence his survival chances is 50%. So the idea is that every prisoner counts number of red hats in front of him. Consider an example of just 5 people. Here, person 1 follows the only rule. If the first person sees an odd number of red hats, he calls out red. If he sees an even number of red hats, he calls out blue. Here, he calls out blue because he sees an even number of red hats and dies. So, person 2 knows that including himself, there are an even number of red hats. He looks forward and can also see an even number of red hats. This means he is wearing a blue hat. Had he been wearing a red hat, then the person behind him would have seen 3, an odd number, which he knows not to be the case. Person 3 knows that to start there were an even number of red hats. He knows that none of them have gone, that is to say nobody other than possibly the first person has declared themselves to be wearing a red hat. So including himself, there are an even number of red hats. He looks forward and can see one red hat, an odd number. That this has changed between him and the people in front of him means he is wearing a red hat. So next, person 4 knows that to start there were an even number of red hats. He knows one has gone, so including himself there is an odd number of red hats. He looks forward and counts zero, an even number of red hats. That this has changed between including and excluding him means he is wearing a red hat. Person 5 knows that to start there were an even number of red hats. He knows that two have gone, so including himself there is an even number of red hats. He looks forward and counts zero, an even number of red hats that this has not changed between including and excluding him means he is wearing a blue hat. So generally someone knows whether the group of n-1 people started with an odd or an even number of red hats and they know the number of red hats that have gone before them. If the number of red hats that have gone before them is even then the number of red hats including them and those forward of them will be as indicated by the first person. If it is odd it will be opposite. Knowing the odd or even nature, 
of the number of red hats including them and the group in front of them they can observe the group in front of them and if they are not the same it must be changed by the hat they are wearing so all but the first person survives and he would have survived had he been wearing a blue hat this gives us an expected survival rate of 99.5 percent for 100 people we can now try a more formulated response to a larger group of 100 people let's analyze the responses If 100% said red, there must have been odd number of red hats in front of him. If 99th prisoner sees odd number of red hats in front of him, then his color is blue. If the 99th prisoner sees even number of red hats in front of him, then his color is red. If 100th prisoner said blue, there must have been even number of red hats in front of him. If 99th prisoner sees odd number of red hats in front of him then his color is red if 99th prisoner sees even number of red hats in front of him then his color is blue the 98th prisoner decides his answer on the basis of answer of 99th prisoner's answer and uses the same logic similarly other prisoners from 97 to 1 are saved so all other prisoners follows the same approach what 99th prisoner followed. So that's all about the logic. Hope you understood the approach required to solve this kind of puzzle. There is an island of puzzles where numbers 1 to 9 want to cross the river. There is a single boat that can take numbers from one side to the other. However, maximum three numbers can go at a time and of course, the boat cannot sail on its own. So, one number must come back after reaching to another side. Also, there is a condition which states that the sum of numbers crossing at a time must be a square number. For example, 1, 2 and 3 cannot cross the river because some of these numbers is 6 which is not square of any number 1 to 9. You need to plan trips such that minimum trips are needed. What is the minimum number of trips required for numbers 1 to 9 to cross the river? This is an interesting math puzzle. Feel free to pause the video and give a try before checking the solution. Let me explain the solution now. Answer to this puzzle is, we need only 7 trips to send all digits across the river. Let me elaborate the solution now. According to the puzzle, the sum of numbers crossing at a time must be a square number. The important thing to remember is, maximum number that can be obtained using any 3 numbers with the range 1 to 9 is 24. That is, by using 7, 8 and 9. So sum of three numbers must be 1 or 4 or 9 or 16. We can eliminate 1 and 4 because no three numbers add up to 1 or 4. The minimum number possible adding three numbers is 6 that is by using 1, 2 and 3. The correct square number that can be used to achieve the solution to this puzzle is 16 which is a square of number 4. So this is how we can achieve. In the first trip, send 2, 5, 9. Sum of these numbers is 16, which is a square of number 4. While coming back, bring back the number 9, which is a second trip. In the third trip, send 3, 4, 9. And again, sum of these numbers is 16, which is a square of number 4. While coming back, bring back the number 9, which is a fourth trip. In the fifth trip, send 1, 7, 8. Some of these numbers is again 16, which is a square of number 4. While coming back, bring back the number 1, which is a 6th trip. Finally, in 7th trip, send 169. Again, some of these numbers is 16, which is a square of number 4. As we can see now, number 1 to 9 have crossed the river in only 7 trips. 
there can be other patterns which can be a solution to this puzzle do share your pattern in the comment section a girl meets a lion and unicorn in the forest the lion lies every monday tuesday and wednesday and the other days he speaks the truth the unicorn lies on thursdays fridays and saturdays and the other days of the week he speaks the truth yesterday i was lying the lion told the girl so was i said the unicorn what day is it based on the statements made by the lion and the unicorn and you are supposed to identify what is the current day as per the puzzle lion lies on mondays tuesdays and wednesdays and the unicorn on the other hand lies on thursdays fridays and saturdays let's create a table and table looks like this as per the table lion lies on mondays tuesdays and wednesdays and the other days lion tells the truth the unicorn lies on thursdays fridays and saturdays and the other days unicorn tells the truth so that is on sundays both must be telling the truth suppose lion and unicorn made those statements today the statements are lion yesterday i was lying unicorn so was i which means yesterday i was too lying if it was sunday today then lion's statement would have been lie as lion tells truth on saturdays but as per data both must be telling the truth on sundays so it can't be sunday today for rest of all days one must be telling the truth and other must be lying let's consider two cases to figure out the correct answer in the case one lion is lying and unicorn is truth teller for unicorn's statement yesterday i too was lying to be true it must be sunday today but on sunday lion always speaks truth and lion's statement can't be true on sunday as concluded earlier hence today must be a different day in case 2 lion is truth teller and unicorn is lying again for lion's statement yesterday i was lying to be true it must be thursday today and if today is thursday unicorn is lying with its statement yesterday i too was lying as it was wednesday yesterday where unicorn always tells truth on wednesday hence today on thursday unicorn must be lying with this statement while lion is telling the truth both statements are as per behaving the given data to simplify on thursday lion tells truth whereas unicorn lies on wednesday lion is lying uh, which makes lion statement that is yesterday i was lying true for thursday unicorn tells truth on wednesday which makes unicorn statement false for thursday since unicorn lies on thursdays and here unicorn is lying and it is behaving as per the given data thus answer to this puzzle is thursday this is a pretty tricky puzzle you need to go through the solution once again to get the complete hold of the answer how can four employees calculate the average of their salaries without knowing others salary here four employees want to know the average of their salaries they are not allowed to share their correct individual salaries how this can be achieved and what is the right way to solve this problem first of all this solution has a limitation that information is partially passed and there needs kind of some trust level so let's say the four coworkers are a b c and d and their individual salaries are s a s b s c and s d respectively 
for knowing the average of their salaries without disclosing their own salaries to each other they have to follow these steps in the first step a adds a random amount say r a to his own salary and gives that to b b won't be able to know a salary as he has added a random amount known to him only in this case b will receive the figure s a plus r a from a in the next step b adds a random amount say r b to his own salary and gives that to c without showing that to a c won't be able to know b's or a's salary as it was added a random amount known to individuals only now c will get the figure s a plus r a plus s b plus r b in the next step c does the same and gives the final figure to d without knowing it to b now d will receive the figure s a plus r a plus s b plus r b plus s c plus r c in the next step d does the same and gives the final figure to a without showing it to c now a will receive the figure s a plus r a plus s b plus r b plus s c plus r c plus s d plus r d now a subtracts is random amount since a knows the random amount initially added and gives the final figure to b without showing that to d b will now receive the figure s a plus s b plus r b plus s c plus r c plus s d plus r d here the random amount which was initially added by a is not present in the next step b subtracts is random amount and gives the final figure to c without showing it to a c will receive the figure s a plus s b plus s c plus r c plus s d plus r d in the next step c does the same thing that is c subtracts is random amount and gives the final figure to d without showing it to b c will receive the figure s a plus s b plus s c plus s d plus r d and finally d subtracts his random amount and then the figure becomes s a plus s b plus s c plus s d now d knows that sum of all salaries now it is easy to get the average by dividing the final figure by 4 which was asked as a part of the puzzle by following these simple steps we can find the average of four employee salary without knowing others salary we can apply the same technique to know the average of more than four people as well we just need to remember that at every stage only two people should share the figures and rest other should not be communicated Monty Hall was the host of game show called Let's Make a Deal on which this puzzle is based. Puzzle states that you are on a game show and you are given the choice of 3 doors. You get to pick one door and if you have picked the right door you win the prize. Behind one door is a car, behind the others goods. You pick a door, say number 1. After you have chosen a door the game show host will not immediately open that particular door the host will open another door that you did not pick and which he knows does not contain the prize assume the host opens another door say number 3 which has a goat he then says to you do you want to pick door number 2 at this point you will be given a choice do you want to stick with your original choice door 1 in the example here or do you want to choose the other unopened door door 2 in this example is it to your advantage to switch your choice will you switch or stay with your door this is an excellent puzzle think over it for some time and share your answer in the comment section once done keep watching the video for the right solution So let me explain the solution now. Here there are three doors. You are asked to choose one door among three doors and the host who knows what's behind the doors opens another door which has a goat. After this you are asked will you switch or stay with your door. Let us analyze what are the possibilities if you choose to switch the door instead of staying back original decision. 
Suppose you always choose door 1. Then host will open door 2 or door 3 behind which car is not there. There are three possibilities. In the first possibility, if the car is behind the door 1, then host will open the door 2 or door 3 and if you switch to remaining door 3 or door 2, you will find goat behind it and you will lose. And in the second possibility, if the car is behind the door 2, then host will be forced to open door 3. Now if you switch your choice to door 2 from door 1, then you will win the car behind the door. In the third possibility, if the car is behind the door 3, then host has to open the door 2 behind which goat is there. And now if you switch your selection from door 1 to door 3, then you will be winning the car. So out of 3 possibilities, in 2 you will be winning the game show if you switch your choice. The probability of winning the game show is 2 over 3. And if you stay with your first choice, then probability of having car behind selected door is 1 over 3. So to conclude, there is a one third chance of the car being behind door number 1 and a two third chance that the car isn't behind door number 1. After Monty Hall opens door number 2 to reveal a goat, there is still a one third chance that the car is behind door number 1 and a two third chance that the car isn't behind door number 1. A two third chance that the car isn't behind door number 1 is a two third chance that the car is behind door number 3. So it's better to switch the choice as it increases the probability of winning the game show from one third to two third. So does this logic applies for any number of doors? Let's analyze. Imagine that instead of three doors, there are hundred. All of them have goods except one, which has the car. You choose a door, say door number 23. At this point, Monty Hall opens all of the other doors except one and gives you the offer to switch to the other door. Would you switch? Now you may arrogantly think, well, maybe I actually picked the correct door on my first guess. But what's the probability that happened? It is 1 over 100. So there is a 99% chance that the car isn't behind the door that you picked. And if it's not behind the door that you picked, it must be behind the last door that Monty left for you. In other words, Monty has helped you by leaving one door for you to switch to that has a 99% chance of having the car behind it. So in this case, if you were to switch, you would have a 99% chance of winning the car. Hence, here also it is better to switch to choice as it increases the probability of winning the game show. These kind of problems uh, requires a proper logical thinking to get into the correct solution. There was a magical pond between three temples. If anybody would wash the flowers in the pond, the flowers doubled. So once a person went to a garden, plucked some flowers and washed it in the magical pond and kept some flowers in one temple. After that, he went to the pond and washed the remaining number of flowers and kept the exact number of flowers that he kept in the first temple in the second temple. He again washed the remaining number of flowers and again kept the same number of flowers he kept in the first and second temple, in the third temple and he was at last left with zero flowers. So what are the number of flowers he plucked from the garden and what are the number of flowers he kept in every temple? This is a popular interview puzzle asked in several job interviews. Feel free to pause the video and give a try before checking the solution. Let me explain the solution now. According to the puzzle, there are three temples and one magical pond. If anybody would wash the flowers in that pond, the flowers doubled. In all the temples, there are exact number of flowers kept. We are supposed to find total number of flowers plucked from the garden and what are the number of flowers kept in every temple. 
Suppose a person start the trip with X flowers and he leave Y flowers at each temple. Here are the number of flowers person have it after each stage of the trip. So at the start, let the number of flowers he plucked be X. Now in pond, he washed X number of flowers. This will result in 2X because if anybody would wash the flowers in that pond, the flowers doubled. Now let the number of flowers he kept in each temple be Y. Hence, at temple 1, Y number of flowers are kept. After this, number of flowers left will be 2X minus Y. Now again in pond, he washed 2X minus Y number of flowers. This will result in 2 times 2X minus Y, which is equal to 4X minus 2Y. This is because we already know if anybody would wash the flowers in that pond, the flowers doubled. So now at temple 2, Y number of flowers are kept again. After this, number of flowers left will be 4X minus 2Y minus Y, which is equal to 4X minus 3Y. Again in pond, he washed 4X minus 3Y number of flowers. This will result in 2 times of 4X minus 3Y, which is equal to 8X minus 6Y. Because we already know that if anybody would wash the flowers in that pond, the flowers doubled. Finally, at temple 3, Y number of flowers are kept. After this, number of flowers left will be 8X minus 6Y minus Y, which is equal to 8X minus 7Y. As per the puzzle, after placing flowers at the third temple, person have no flowers. This means the final equation is equal to 0. Here the final equation is 8x minus 7y. Hence, 8x minus 7y equals 0. After simplifying, x equals 7 over 8 times y. We want to find whole number solution to this equation. As the fraction 7 over 8 cannot be reduced any further, the variable y needs to be a multiple of 8 to eliminate the denominator. The smallest value for y is 8, which means the smallest value for x is 7. So the answer is person started with 7 flowers and he left 8 flowers at each temple. So let's validate the solution now. At start, let the number of flowers he plucked is 7. In pond, he washed 7 flowers. This will result in 14 because if anybody would wash the flowers in the pond, the flowers doubled. Now the number of flowers he kept in each temple is 8. Hence, at temple 1, 8 flowers are kept. After this, number of flowers left will be 14 minus 8, which is equal to 6. Now again in pond, he washed 6 flowers. That will result in 12 because we already know if anybody would wash the flowers in that pond, the flowers doubled. Also, we know that the number of flowers he kept in each temple is 8. Hence, at temple 2, 8 flowers are kept. After this, number of flowers left will be 12 minus 8, which is equal to 4. Now, again in pond, he washed 4 flowers. This will result in 8 because the number of flowers doubled. Finally, in temple 3, 8 flowers are kept because that is the number of flowers he kept in each temple. After this, number of flowers left will be 8 minus 8 which is equal to 0. And this is what it is expected. The solution to this puzzle is, the person plucked 7 flowers from the garden and 8 he kept in every temple. So by following these simple steps, we can find the solution in less time and accurately. There are four prisoners. All four prisoners will be freed if at least one of them correctly guesses the color of the hat on his head. They can't speak to each other and they can't touch each other. However, if they take part and one of them gives a wrong answer or none of them can work out the answer at all, then their sentences will be doubled. They are told that there are four hats, two white and two black. Each man will have a hat placed on his head while blindfolded. When each man is wearing a hat, the blindfolds will be removed. 
The prisoners will not be able to see their own hats and the only way they can work out what color hat they are wearing will be from looking at the hats the other prisoners are wearing. All they have to do to win their freedom is for one of them to work out what color hat he is wearing. But there is a twist. To make it more interesting, three prisoners stand in a line facing a brick wall. The prisoner at the back, say A, stands on a box and can see both of the prisoners in front of him, say B and C. Prisoner B stands on a smaller box and can only see prisoner C, who in turn can only see the wall. The fourth prisoner D stands on the other side of the wall and can see nothing of the other prisoners nor his own hat. They are not allowed to turn around or converse in any way. There are no mirrors and they all know that there are two black hats and two white hats and that there are four people. The prisoners are told that they have five minutes and to call out as soon as one of them thinks he knows for certain what color hat he is wearing. And remember, if just one of them gets the answer wrong, they will all have their sentences doubled. One of the prisoners says, I know the color of my hat. And solves the riddle. Which prisoner is that? The placement of the prisoners in the room is as the following. Can you solve this riddle? Feel free to pause the video and give a try before checking the solution. Let me explain the solution now. Each one of the prisoners knows that there are four hats, two black and two white. If prisoner A observes that prisoner B and C have the same colored hats, he would assume that he has the opposite color and solve the riddle. However, since prisoner B and C have different colored hats, prisoner A doesn't say anything. After waiting about four minutes, prisoner B calls out the right answer. You can see that C is wearing a white hat. If B was wearing a white hat too, then A would have seen two white hats and would have known that his hat was black. As A didn't say anything, B knew that he and C must have different color hats on and as C's hat is white, B knew that his hat must be black. Through this logical approach, prisoner B could able to answer the right hat color and all four prisoners will be freed. A team of three people decide on a strategy for playing the following game. Each player walks into a room. On the way in, a fair coin is tossed for each player, deciding that player's hat color either red or blue. Each player can see the hat colors of the other two players but cannot see his own hat color. After inspecting each other's hat colors, each player decides on a response which are one of the following. I have a red hat or I have a blue hat or I pass. The player's responses are recorded but the responses are not shared until every player has recorded his response. The team wins if at least one player responds with a color and every color response correctly describes the hat color of the player making the response. In other words, the team loses if either everyone responds with I pass or someone responds with a color that is different from his hat color. What strategy should one use to maximize the team's expected chance of winning? Let me repeat the puzzle. A team of three people decide on a strategy for playing the following game. Each player walks into a room. On the way in, a fair coin is tossed for each player, deciding the player's hat color either red or blue. Each player can see the hat colors of the other two players but cannot see his own hat color. After inspecting each other's hat colors, each player decides on a response which are one of the following. I have a red hat or I have a blue hat or I pass. The player's responses are recorded but the responses are not shared until every player has recorded his response. The team wins if at least one player responds with a color and every color responds correctly 
describes the hat color of the player making the response. In other words, the team loses if either everyone responds with I pass or someone responds with a color that is different from his hat color. What strategy should one use to maximize the team's expected chance of winning? For example, one possible strategy is to single out one of the three players. This player will respond, I have a red hat and the others will respond, I pass. The expected chance of winning with this strategy is 50%. Can you do better? A better solution exists for 75% chances of winning. Let me explain the solution in detail. Let the players be player A, player B and player C. With three players and two hat colors, there are a total of 8 likely outcomes. Here are the outcomes. One special feature about the distribution is that most outcomes, that is 6 of them, include at least one hat of both colors. Here are the 6 outcomes which have at least one hat of both colors. As we can see here in these 6 combinations, 3 combinations include 2 red color hats and other 3 combinations include 2 blue color hats. Only two extreme outcomes don't have at least one hat of both colors. Remaining are the ones with all red hats or all blue hats. We can analyze further, among outcomes with both hat colors, there logically has to be two hats of one color. We call it as the majority color and one hat of another color, we call it as the minority color. Here is the representation of majority and minority colors. Here in the outcomes, in first, second and fourth combinations, red is majority color and blue is minority color. But in third, fifth and sixth combinations, blue is majority color and red is minority color. Now, by looking at the other hats, player can identify whether they are wearing a majority color or a minority color. For instance, if a player sees both a red and blue hat, then the player must be wearing the majority color which could be red or blue. If a player sees two blue or two red hats, then the player must be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here is what players can reason among the six choices. If the player is wearing minority color, then he knows that the color, which will be the opposite, a color of what the player sees. For example, if a player sees two blue or two red hats, then the player must be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in the first combination, if the player C is guessing the hat, now the player sees two red hats, then the player must be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is blue color. In the second combination, if the player B is guessing the hat, now the player sees two red hats, then the player must be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is blue color. Similarly, in the third combination, if the player A is guessing the hat, now the player sees two blue hats, then the player must be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is red color. So now the idea is to get the player with the minority hat color to guess and force the other people to pass. So here is the strategy. If you see both a red and a blue hat, then pass. If you see two red hats, then guess blue. If you see two blue hats, then guess red. This strategy wins in all six cases with at least one hat of each color. It only loses in the two cases of all red or all blue in which all players guess incorrectly. Here is how players would guess. Here in the first combination, player A sees two red hats. Then the player thinks he will be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is blue color. Since he is wearing red color hat, team will lose. Same happens with player B and player C. Similarly, in the fifth combination where all players wearing blue hats, here also team loses. Here in the combination, player A sees two blue hats. 
then the player thinks he will be wearing the minority color which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case it is red color. Since he is wearing blue color hat, team will lose. Same happens with player B and player C. So now let's consider the second combination. Here player A see one red and one blue hat, hence player replies as I pass. Player B again see one red and one blue hat, hence player replies as I pass. Player C see two red hats, then the player thinks he will be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is blue color and it will matches and team wins. Now let's consider the third combination. In the third combination, player A sees one red and one blue hat, hence player replies as I pass. Player B sees two red hats, then the player thinks he will be wearing the minority color, which will be the opposite color of what the player sees. Here in this case, it is blue color and it will matches and team wins. Finally, player C sees one red and one blue hat, hence player replies as I pass. The same logic is applied for other four combinations and team wins in all these combinations. So the group wins in six of eight possible outcomes, a hoping 75% chance. So if you follow this strategy, there is a 75% chances of winning the game. This is a little a complex puzzle, requires solid strategy in order to solve this problem. An intelligent trader travels from one place to another carrying three sacks having 30 coconuts each. No sack can hold more than 30 coconuts. On the way he passes through 30 checkpoints and on each checkpoint he has to give one coconut for each sack carrying. How many coconuts are left in the end? Let me repeat the puzzle. An intelligent trader travels from one place to another carrying three sacks having 30 coconuts each. No sack can hold more than 30 coconuts. On the way he passes through 30 checkpoints and on each checkpoint he has to give one coconut for each sack carrying. The question is how many coconuts are left in the end. Let's assume that the maximum capacity of each sack is 30 coconuts. In the first view, most of the people think that the answer to this puzzle is zero. If you take all conditions literally, then nothing would be left. But the keyword here is intelligent trader. So you need to think according to an intelligent trader. Being an intelligent trader, he will definitely use all his intelligence to get the profit that is by trying to save as much coconut as possible. Now I am going to explain step by step how the trader is going to save maximum coconuts possible. Initially, the trader passes through 10 checkpoints, leaving the trader with 20 coconuts per sack. It is because on every checkpoint, the trader has to give one coconut from each sack. This means at the end of 10 checkpoints, total left out coconuts in each sack is 20. The trick to save coconuts lies at this point. At this point, what trader does is, uh, he distributes all coconuts from one sack into the other two sacks, leaving two sacks each filled with 30 coconuts and one sack will be empty at this point. From here, at each checkpoint, trader have to give only two coconuts because there are only two sacks left. Later, trader passes through 15 more checkpoints. After passing through 15 more checkpoints, the trader now has 15 coconuts per sack or 30 coconuts in total. At this point, trader will transfer the coconuts into one sack. Now the trader is left with 30 coconuts in a sack. From here, at each checkpoint, trader have to give only one coconut because there is only one sack left. By this point, 25 checkpoints already covered and remaining checkpoints are 5. Now trader will pass through the 5 remaining checkpoints and if trader spends another 5 coconuts in other 5 checkpoints, the trader is left with 25 coconuts. Thus answer to this puzzle is, the total number of coconuts left in the end is 25.
Out of 200 fish in an aquarium, 99% are red. How many red fishes must be removed in order to reduce at 98%? This is an amazing math puzzle. Though it looks simple, it is more trickier than we think. Let me explain the solution now. Initially, we know that total number of fish given is 200 and 99% are red, 1% non-red. Since only red fish must be removed, indirectly the question says that number of non-red fish must be constant. As per the question, initially 1% of fish are non-red, that is 1 over 100 multiplied with 200 which is equal to 2. Currently, the percentage of red fish is 99% in the aquarium full of 200 fishes. So, total red fish is equal to 198 and non-red fish equals 2. Let's say after removing X red fish, the percentage of red fish becomes 98%. This can be represented in the form of equation like this. 198 minus X over 200 minus X equals 98 over 100. 198 minus x represents number of red fishes in aquarium after removing x red fish. 200 minus x represents total number of fishes remains in aquarium which includes non-red fishes as well. RHS represents the percentage what we need to achieve. So let's solve this equation. After simplification, equation becomes 50 times 198 minus 50x equals 49 times 200 minus 49x. So x equals 9900 minus 9800 which is equal to 100. So now x equals 100. So it is tough to imagine that we will have to remove 100 fishes out of 198 red fish to bring the percentage down by 1% in a total of 200 fishes. The point to be paid attention is that when we are removing the red fish from the aquarium, we are decreasing the total number of fishes in the aquarium. So had we been converting every red fish taken out to a non-red fish and kept them back in the aquarium, only converting two red fish to non-red would have brought the percentage of red fish in the aquarium down to 98%. When something is subtracted from both numerator and denominator, the overall effect on the fraction is quite small, especially if numerator and denominator are large compared to the small amount subtracted from both. In this question, if you remove two red fish out of the 198 red, the new percentage is 98.989898, which is quite close to the original 99%. In fact, when a small amount delta is subtracted from both numerator and denominator, the change in the value of the fraction is a small number nu delta and the increase in delta is proportional to the increase in nu delta which is also the decrease in the value of the fraction. Here the fraction value decreases approximately by 0.005% when we decrease the number of red fish by 1% this rate of change can be calculated by differentiating the above equation. And this is another way to solve this question. So we have to remove 100 red fish. So the number of red fish in total becomes 98%. It is quite unbelievable answer. The difference of percentage is 1 but the difference in number is 100. A duck that is being chased by a fox saves itself by sitting at the center of circular pond of radius r. The duck can fly from land but cannot fly from the water. Furthermore, the fox cannot swim. The fox is four times faster than the duck. Assuming that the duck and fox are perfectly smart, is it possible for the duck to ever reach the edge of the pond and fly away to its escape from the ground. Let me repeat the puzzle. A duck that is being chased by a fox saves itself by sitting at the center of circular pond of radius r. 
the duck can fly from land but cannot fly from the water furthermore the fox cannot swim the fox is four times faster than the duck assuming that the duck and fox are perfectly smart is it possible for the duck to ever reach the edge of the pond and fly away to its escape from the ground Let's check the solution now. This is not a simple mathematical puzzle to solve like normal common problems. Fox in this puzzle is too fast and clever for any normal and simple strategy. One would think that the duck could swim directly away from the fox, so the duck would have to swim a distance r. The fox would have to cover off the circumference of the pond that is pi r. pi r because the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r but here fox has to cover off the circumference hence distance becomes pi r but this strategy won't work since the fox is four times faster than the duck we know that the value of pi is 3.14 thus pi into r this is the distance which should be covered by the fox whereas 4 into r is the distance to be covered by duck but as we know that since the value of pi is 3.14 pi r is less than 4 into r hence in this strategy by the time duck swims to near the land fox would have already reached which puts duck into danger this would make it seem like it is impossible for the duck to escape but there is a way to escape so how could the duck make life more difficult for the fox If the duck just tries to swim along a radius, the fox could just sit along the radius and the duck would continue to be trapped. Logic is the duck could swim in concentric circles so that the fox has to continuously run along the circumference of the pond to stay on the same radius as the duck. If the duck swims near the edge of the pond, the fox could easily keep up since they would be covering approximately the same distance and the fox is four times faster but what if the duck swam close to the center of the pond the duck would have to cover a smaller circumference in this case and could use this strategy to put some distance between the fox and itself consider at a distance of r by 4 from the center of the pond the circumference of the pond is exactly four times the circumference of the duck's path because we have consider the distance is r by 4 where r is the radius let the duck rotate around the pond in a circle of radius r by 4 now fox and duck will take exact same time to make a full circle because the fox is four times the speed of the duck so at a distance of r by 4 from the center of the pond the circumference of the pond is exactly four times the circumference of the duck's path thus to stay on the same radius as the duck the fox would barely keep up now reduce the radius the duck is circling by a very small amount now the fox will lag behind it cannot stay at a position as well say the duck circles the pond at a distance r by 4 minus e where e is an infinite simal amount so as the duck continues to swim along this radius it would slowly gain some distance over the fox once the duck is able to gain 180 degrees over the fox the duck would have to cover a distance of 3 r by 4 plus e to reach the edge of the pond So why 3r by 4 plus e? This is because the duck is already at the distance r by 4 minus e. So the distance what it has to cover to reach the land is 3r by 4, which is the remaining distance plus e, which is an infinite simal amount. So in the meanwhile, the fox would have to cover off the circumference of the pond, that is the 180 degrees at that point. So here since pi r which is a distance to be covered by the fox is greater than 4 into 3 r by 4 plus e which is a distance to be covered by duck in the same time since pi r which is distance to be covered by fox is greater than 
4 into 3 r by 4 plus e which is a distance to be covered by duck. So as we clearly see that the time taken by a duck to reach the land is greater than the time taken by a fox to reach the duck at that particular point of time. So that's the reason the duck will reach the land and it will fly and escape. So in this way the duck would be able to make it to land and fly away. So this is a fantastic puzzle. If you have not understood the solution, please watch it again. This requires a thorough understanding of the problem in order to understand how this particular solution works. In a medical laboratory, you have 240 injections, one of which is for anesthesia for a rat. If anesthesia injection is injected in a rat, it will faint in exactly 24 hours. You have 5 rats available to determine which one injection contains the anesthesia. How do you achieve this in 48 hours? To simplify this puzzle, uh, according to this puzzle, you have 5 rats and 240 injections. Any small dosage of anesthesia takes around 24 hours to be effective on a rat. Given the nature of anesthesia, effectiveness refers to its tendency to make the rat faint. Thus, any dosage of this anesthesia should make them faint in approximately 24 hours. As the rest of 239 injections shows no effect, how will you find that particular injection which has anesthesia in it using the 5 rats you have within a period of 48 hours, that is in 2 days. This is an interesting logical puzzle asked in several job interviews. Now take your time to arrive at a solution and continue to watch further once you are done. Let me explain the solution now. Let's start solving this by naming the rats as rat1, rat2, rat3, rat4 and rat5. Our next step is to label each injection with a number. We are using 5 digit number with 0, 1 and 2 being the only digits in them. For example, our labels will look like double one triple zero one zero two two one. 1, 2, 0, 1, 1, etc. You may have the question why 5 digits and why only 0, 1 and 2. Now this is because using 3 numbers 0, 1 and 2 as 5 digit numbers we have 3 power 5 which is equal to 243 unique ways of arranging the numbers. As we are left with 240 injections this would give us enough ways of labeling each of them. Here is the data which shows 243 possible arrangements of which only 240 we are going to use. So far we have labeled them, now what are we going to do with this? Each place in the 5 digit number corresponds to each rat. Let's take the injection 12210. Here the leftmost digit that is 1 corresponds to rat 1 and the rightmost digit that is 0 corresponds to rat 5. A rat that is assigned with the number 1 will be given that injection on day 1 that is at the start of the first 24 hours. Similarly a rat that is assigned the number 2 will be given the injection on day 2 that is at the start of next 24 hours. And a rat which is assigned with the number 0 will not be given that injection at all. So to make this easier, consider an injection labeled 12210. Since the leftmost digit belongs to rat1, a small dosage of this injection will be given to rat1 on the first day. Second place corresponds to rat2, so another small dosage of the same injection will be given to it on day 2 because we have the digit 2 in that place. Third place belongs to rat 3 and it will be injected on day 2. Fourth place belongs to rat 4 and it will be injected on day 1. Fifth place belongs to rat 5 and the corresponding digit being 0, rat 5 will not be given this injection on both days. 
Our rat 5 is so unlucky that it never gets to taste it. In a similar way, we inject each of those 240 injections by following the label instructions given on them. Here, I have made a list of injections received by each rat on both days. Have a quick glance at them if you are still confused with the labeling. Now that we have injected all this, how do we know which one is the Anastasia? Let's again take the injection labeled 12210 as an example. If 12210 was the only Anastasia, RAT1 and RAT4 which received its dosage on the start of day 1 should faint after 24 hours. RAT2 and RAT3 which received its dosage at the start of day 2 should faint when the second day ends. Finally, RAT5 which never received this dosage will stay awake. This pattern of fainting will not be repeated in any other injection as all of them are labeled in a unique way to make the rats faint. Remember, if any of the rats fainted at the end of day 1 itself, it will not be given any further injections as it is already under the influence of anesthesia. So at the end of 48 hours, by observing the fainting pattern of rats, we can find the anesthesia by matching the pattern to the label provided on the injection. Apart from the method which I have explained now, there is another way of arriving the solution. Split 240 injections among 5 rats and inject each of them with 48 unique dosages. Consecutive injections should be given at a regular interval of 30 minutes so that at the end of day 1, all the injection that is 48 times 5 which is equal to 240 will be distributed among the rats. Timing should be noted while injecting each time. If any such rat was to faint, we can simply note the time at which it faints and trace back 24 hours to find the injection given at that time, which is our anesthesia. Unlike the previous method in which we observed a pattern of fainting, here uh, we will observe only one rat getting fainted as the injection it received wouldn't have been injected to any other rats. The issue with using the second method is that the consecutive injection interval of 30 minutes is too small to trace back to the right injection as we can't be sure whether the effect of the drug was delayed. Of course, this method is simpler but works only when we can assure that the drug would show its effect in exactly 24 hours. Hence, it is better to go with the first method. Suppose a newly born pair of rabbits, one male, one female, are put in a field. Rabbits are able to mate at the age of one month so that at the end of its second month, a female can produce another pair of rabbits. Suppose that rabbits never die and that the female always produces one new pair, one male and one female, every month from the second month on. How many pairs? will there be in one year. Let me explain the solution now. To begin with, initially there are newly born pair of rabbits. Also we know that newly born pair of rabbits, one male, one female, or put in a field, rabbits are able to mate at the age of one month so that at the end of its second month, a female can produce another pair of rabbits. So at the end of the first month, they mate, but there is still, there will be only one pair. It is because rabbits are able to mate at the age of one month so that at the end of its second month only, a female can produce another pair of rabbits. At the end of the second month, the female produces a new pair, so now there are two pairs of rabbits in the field. So at the end of the second month, there are two pairs. At the end of the third month, the original female produces a second pair, making three pairs in all in the field. This is because it is given in the question 
that rabbits never die and that the female always produces one new pair that is one male one female every month from the second month on so at the end of the third month there are three pairs now at the end of the fourth month the original female has produced yet another new pair the female born two months ago produces her first pair also making five pairs so at the end of fourth month there are five pairs now at the end of fifth month the original female has produced yet another new pair the female born 3 months ago produces her second pair the female born 2 months ago produces her first pair making eight pairs so at the end of the fifth month there are eight pairs this continues but the problem is it is difficult to keep the track and solve this problem like this let's check is there a pattern to generalize the solution so pattern is initially there is one pair at the end of first month still there is one pair at the end of second month there are two pairs at the end of third month there are three pairs after four month there are five pairs after fifth month there are eight pairs and this continues and this is the sequence of numbers which famously called the fibonacci sequence in the fibonacci sequence the next number is found by adding up the two numbers before it here is a first 13 fibonacci numbers as we can clearly see that here the first two numbers are 0 and 1 the next number is found by adding up the two numbers here the first two numbers are 0 and 1 next number 1 is found by adding the two numbers before that that is 0 plus 1 equals 1 the next number 2 is found by adding the two numbers before it that is 1 plus 1 equals 2 The next number three is found by adding the two numbers before it. That is one plus two equals three, and the next number five is found by adding the two numbers before it. That is two plus three equals five, and this continues. This puzzle follows the Fibonacci sequence, starting with one. Here is the sequence which represents the number of pairs present after one year. So as we can clearly see that. there are 233 pairs of rabbits present after one year with this logic thus answer to this puzzle is 233 pairs of rabbits there are 233 pairs which will be there in one year for your information fibonacci sequence was first discovered by italian mathematician fibonacci also known as leonardo bonacci the original problem that fibonacci investigated was in the year 1201 and it was about how fast rabbits could breed in ideal circumstances a stick 100 units long needs to be cut into 100 unit pieces what is the minimum number of cuts required if you are allowed to cut several stick pieces at the same time This is an interesting interview puzzle don't come to conclusion immediately this requires a proper logical thinking to find the correct solution Let me explain the solution now in step by step the minimum number of cuts needed is 7 first each cut can at most double the number of pieces you have therefore you will need to make at least 7 cuts this is because 2 power 6 equals 64 which is less than 100 while 2 power 7 equals 128 which is greater than 100 let me explain now how 7 cuts suffices to cut 100 units long stick into 100 unit pieces the following sequence of cuts works in the first step cut at 64 units from the left that is cut the stick into a length of 64 units and a length of 36 units in the second step lay your two pieces on top of each other align at the left and cut it 32 units from the left it means in this step lay the pieces so that the left ends line up and then cut so that you have three pieces of length 32 and one piece of length 4 In all future cuts we will also start by laying the pieces so that their left ends line up. So in the third step lay all your pieces 
on top of each other aligned at the left and cut it 16 units from the left which means cut the pieces into 6 pieces of length 16 and 1 piece of length 4. In this step we do not actually cut the piece of length 4. In the fourth step lay all your pieces on top of each other aligned at the left and cut at 8 units from the left which means cut the pieces into 12 pieces of length 8 and 1 piece of length 4. In the fifth step, lay all your pieces on top of each other, aligned at the left and cut at 4 units from the left, cut the pieces into 25 pieces of length 4. In the sixth step, cut the 25 pieces into 50 pieces of length 2. In the final step, cut the 50 pieces into 100 pieces of length 1. This procedure uses 7 cuts. To see that 6 or less cuts cannot solve the problem, note that a cut can at most double the number of pieces. So after 6 cuts, you cannot have more than 64 pieces. So answer to this puzzle is, there are 7 cuts required to cut 100 units long stick into 100 units pieces. I believe that this algorithm of always cutting the largest power of 2 which is smaller than the largest pieces will be optimal in general, not just for 100 pieces. How many diagonals can be drawn by joining the vertices of an octagon? Let me repeat the question. How many diagonals can be drawn by joining the vertices of an octagon? Let me explain the solution now. Octagon is 8 sided polygon. If you draw an octagon, select one vertex and construct each diagonal from this vertex. You will see there are 5 such diagonals. Thus for each of the 8 vertices you can draw 5 diagonals and hence there can be 5 times 8 which equals to 40 diagonals. But remember each diagonal is counted twice once from each of its ends. Thus there are 20 diagonals in a regular octagon. So to summarize, each point on the octagon can be connected to 8 minus 3 points. This is because you cannot draw diagonal by joining the adjacent vertex. Hence we need to subtract 3 vertices. So each point can form 5 diagonals. So we get 40 in all. However, this includes similar pairs that is 1, 6, 6, 1, 2, 4, 4, 2, etc. So we divide this by 2. So answer is 20. We can generalize the solution for any polygon. If n is the number of vertices, we can derive the formula. To draw a diagonal, uh, you have to select two vertices out of n. But you cannot draw diagonal by joining the adjacent vertex. Hence, number of diagonals can be calculated using the technique of combination. Number of diagonals equals n c2 minus n where n is the number of sides of the polygon so for octagon n equals 8 hence number of diagonals equals 8 c2 minus 8 so 8 c2 is nothing but 8 times 7 divided by 2 times 1 so after solving this the expression becomes 28 minus 8 which is equal to 20 there is another way which is easier compared to this technique the number of diagonals of an n-sided polygon can also be calculated using the formula n times n minus 3 over 2. For example, in a square, there are 4 vertices. In this case, n becomes 4. Hence, after substituting number of diagonals possible in square is 4 times 4 minus 3 over 2, which is equal to 2. Similarly, in octagon, there are 8 vertices. Hence, n is 8. After substituting, expression becomes 8 times 8 minus 3 divided by 2. After solving this expression, the solution is 20. Just remember this formula, that is n times n minus 3 over 2. You can find number of diagonals in any polygon in less than 5 seconds.
you need to fill in the gaps with the digits from 1 to 9 so that the equation makes sense. Here the colon means divide. Follow the order of operations, multiply first, then division, addition and subtraction last. There is no complicated maths involved, only basic arithmetic, but it's not an easy one. This problem is difficult even for adults good at math. All you need to do is place the digits from 1 to 9 in the grid. The challenge was to fill in the above snake with the digits 1 to 9 using each digit only once. The colon means divide and you must follow the standard order of operations, meaning that multiplication division comes before addition subtraction. So the best way to solve this problem is through forming equation. Rewrite the snake as an equation. There are 9 gaps. Fill the gaps from A to I as follows. Now equation can be written as a plus 13b over c plus d plus 12e minus f minus 11 plus gh over i minus 10 which is equal to 66. We are trying to find a to i which we know are some combination of the digits 1 to 9. Before we even look for a solution, consider the total number of ways we could fill in the snake. There are 362,880 possible combinations of the digits 1 to 9 placed in 9 slots. But we can solve this problem easily by simplifying the equation. So we can simplify the equation to a plus 13b over c plus d plus 12e minus f plus gh over i equals 66 plus 11 plus 10 which is equal to 87. So after simplifying this equation, the equation becomes a plus d minus f plus 13b over c plus 12e plus gh over i equals 87. From here we can assume that b over c and gh over i will be whole numbers and also that we don't want 13b over c to be too big. Knowing this we start plugging numbers in and seeing where we get to. There is more than one solution. Uh, there are many different guesses that will lead to the right number. There are over 100 solutions to this particular problem. To keep the term 13b over c as small as we can, let b equals 2 and c equals 1, which gets us to a plus d minus f plus 26 plus 12e plus gh over i equals 87. And after simplifying, the equation becomes a plus d minus f plus 12e plus gh over i equals 61. The numbers remaining are the digits from 3 to 9. They include the prime numbers 3, 5 and 7. Let's get rid of them as SAP so they don't complicate the other terms. Let's put A equals 3, D equals 5 and F equals 7 which leaves us with 3 plus 5 minus 7 plus 12E plus GH over I which is equal to 61 or 12E plus GH over I equals 60. The now uh, the numbers remaining are 4, 6, 8, 9 playing around with these gets us e equals 4, g equals 9, h equals 8, i equals 6. After substituting, the equation becomes 48 plus 72 over 6 equals 48 plus 12 which is equal to 60. Now we have filled all the gaps. After filling, snake looks like this. And of course it makes sense. There are some puzzles that you solve with a flash of insight and some others like this one where there is no alternative but trial and error. Both kinds can be very satisfying to solve. There was a prison consisting of 1000 cells numbered from 1 to 1000. Each cell can be marked with plus or minus sign. Initially, all cells were marked with minus sign. From days 1 to 1000, the jailer toggles marks on the cell from plus to minus or vice versa. On the ith day, the signs on cells that are multiples of i get toggled. Now in the process of verification on 1001th day, 
all cells marked with plus signs are opened. Can you identify the cell numbers with plus sign? This is an interesting puzzle which is frequently asked during job interviews. If you have not understood the question, go through it again. Feel free to pause the video and give a try before checking the solution. Let me explain the solution now. It is given that in the puzzle, there was a prison consisting of 1000 cells numbered from 1 to 1000. Each cell can be marked with plus or minus sign. Initially, all cells were marked with minus sign. From days 1 to 1000, the jailer toggles marks on the cell from plus to minus or vice versa. It is also given that jailer will toggle the cell on certain condition that if the day number is a multiple of cell number, then the cell is toggled. For example, on fifth day, cell numbers 5, 10, 15, so on are toggled because here day number is multiple of cell numbers. Let's check now what happens on different days from the beginning. On the first day, jailer toggles all cells because all cell numbers are factors of 1. On the second day, he will toggle the cell numbers which are factors of 2, that is 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. Similarly, on the third day, jailer will toggle the cell numbers which are factors of 3, that is 3, 6, 9, 12. Similarly, on the fourth day, jailer will toggle the cell numbers which are factors of 4, that is 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. And this step repeats till thousandth day. A cell gets toggled as many times as the number of divisor it has. Now consider some random number. For example, let's take cell number 20. Let's see on which days this cell number is toggled. How to find it? This is simple. Just find the factors of the cell number and those are the days that cell will be toggled. Factors of 20 are 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20. Hence, it gets toggled on days 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20. Now, the important observation is that we can see that divisors come in pairs. Like 20 equals 1 times 20, which is equal to 2 times 10, which is equal to 4 times 5. We can see that total number of divisor is even. If the divisor is even, then obviously the cell number will be marked with minus sign since initial marking on the cell is minus. Let's consider one more example, cell number 24. Factors of 24 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12 and 24. Cell number 24 is toggled on days 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12 and 24. Now divisors comes in pairs like 24 equals 1 times 24, 2 times 12, 3 times 8, 4 times 6. So the total number of divisors is even. If the divisor is even, then obviously the cell number will be marked with minus sign since initial marking on the cell is minus. Now next big question is, does this hold good for all numbers? Answer is no. This trend is not followed if the number is a perfect square. In perfect square, total number of divisors will become odd. For example, 36. Their factors are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, 18, 36. Clearly here, the number of factors are odd. When the number of devices are odd, then cell number will end up with marking plus. Hence, the answer is all cell numbers with perfect square. So these cells are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49 and so on. Here is the list of all cell numbers which will be marked plus on 1001th day and these cells will be opened on the same day. On a circle, there are 2014 light bulbs, two are on and 2012 are off. You can choose any bulb and change the neighbor state from on to off or from off to on. Doing so, can we get all 2014 light bulbs on? If yes, 
half. So let me repeat the puzzle. On a circle, there are 2014 light bulbs. Two are on state and remaining 2012 are in off state. You can choose any bulb and change the neighbor state from on to off or from off to on. Remember, if you select any bulb, you can change the state of the neighboring bulbs only. Doing so, can we get all 2014 light bulbs on? If S, O. This puzzle is a perfect example which requires out-of-box thinking. Most of the students or candidates give up solving this problem and most of the time they end up answering unrealistic answers for the puzzle. If you think that it is not possible to get all 2014 light bulbs on, then you are wrong. Yes, it is possible to get all 2014 light bulbs on. Let's look at the most logical way of solving this kind of puzzles. For the convenience, label 2014 bulbs from B1 to B 2014. First and foremost, the most important point is the position of the light bulbs, which is on state is not given. So we assume that they are adjacent and make sure that you are naming the bulbs from here. This is the logic you must remember for this puzzle. That is, the two light bulbs which is in on state, which is mentioned in the puzzle, their positions are not given. So what we do is we assume that they are adjacent and we will make sure that when we are naming the bulbs, we are starting from this particular point. So example like this, we will start naming the bulbs from the bulbs which are in on state. For example, here B1 and B2 will be in the on state from B3 till B2014, they will be in the off state. Also, it is given in the question that is they are placed in a circular path. Now since two bulbs is in on state and remaining 2012 bulbs are in off state, clearly all 2012 bulbs which is in off state are adjacent. Now we will operate on these 2012 bulbs like this. Create a group of four off bulbs. We can choose any off bulb apart from the one next to on bulb and be able to make two bulb adjacent to it in on state. Now choose the third bulb which we just turn in on state and make two more bulbs in on state. So clearly we can make four adjacent bulbs in on state. Let's understand with an example. First, create a group of four bulbs with B3, B4, B5, B6. Remember B1, B2 are already in on state. At starting, all four bulbs are in off state. First choose second bulb in the group and turn neighboring bulbs 193 in on state. This looks like this. Now choose third bulb and turn neighboring bulbs 2 and 4 in on state. By doing this, all four bulbs are in on state. Once this is done, consider another group adjacent to group 1 and call it group 2 with B7, B8, B9, B10 bulbs. At starting, as we know, all four bulbs are in off state. First choose second bulb in the group 2 and turn neighboring bulbs 193 in on state and this looks like this. Now choose third bulb and turn neighboring bulbs 2 and 4 in on state. By doing this, all four bulbs are in on state in group 2 as well. By repeating these steps, we can turn all 2012 bulbs into on state. Since there are 2012 bulbs, we have to create 503 groups. 503 is because 4 into 503 which will be resulting in 2012. And by repeating the above steps which I have already discussed, we can turn all 2012 bulbs in on state. There are five pirates, A, B, C, D and E. They have a strict hierarchy. A is senior to B, B is senior to C, C is senior to D and D is senior to E. So it is like A's age is greater than B, B's age is greater than C, C's age is greater than D and D's age is greater than E. And this hierarchy is very strict. 
these pirates have thousand gold coins which they want to distribute among themselves the rules of distribution is as follows the most senior pirate proposes a distribution of coins the pirates including the proposer then vote on whether to accept this distribution which means all the pirates including the most senior will vote on whether they accept the proposed distribution or not if the majority accepts the plan the coins are distributed and the game ends which implies that if off or more pirates vote in the favor of distribution then proposed distribution is accepted and game ends there if more than off pirates votes against the distribution then the senior most pirate will be killed and the next senior most will propose a new distribution and this will continue the process repeats until a plan is accepted or if there is one pirate left in case of a tie vote the proposer has the casting vote the casting vote is a vote that someone may exercise to resolve a deadlock so these are distribution rules and there are some rules followed by pirate also and these are the rules every a pirate follows first of all each pirate want to survive the second given survival each pirate want to maximize the number of gold coins he gets third given a situation of no gain no loss each pirate would prefer to kill the other pirate considering that all pirates are very strong in logic and if a logic can be deduced then they will deduce it the problem statement is how should pirate a distribute the coins so that it does not get killed and also gets the maximum coins possible so i will repeat how should a distribute that is the most senior pirate will distribute the coins so that it does not get killed and also gets the maximum coins possible naturally it may appear that a will have to give most of the coins if not all to the junior pirates so that his life can be saved but that will not work because every pirate wants to maximize coins suppose if a decide to distribute 250 coins to each b c d and e and keeps nothing for himself to get saved then also e will be killed because all others will vote against him they can get the same distribution even if a is killed and pirates want other pirates to be killed this is because the next senior pirate may think that he will get more coins compared to the current distribution hence disagrees similar thought process goes with every pirate and hence everyone disagrees with the logic because every pirate wants to maximize number of coins so finding a solution like this is very difficult the solution to such puzzles can be easily found working in the bottom up approach let's go step by step suppose if number of pirate is 1 that is if there is just one pirate say e then the distribution is very easy e keeps everything to himself this is the most ideal scenario number 2 suppose if there are two pirates say d and e d is senior to e then the distribution strategy should be done by d d will distribute the coins like this pirate d can easily propose that he gets all the 1000 gold coins since he constitutes 50% of the pirates because there are only two pirates in this scenario the proposal has to be accepted leaving pirate e with nothing so pirate e knows now he gets nothing if there are only two pirates are left In this case D will vote in favor of his distribution and the distribution will be accepted because of people voted in favor it. So in this scenario D gets everything and E gets nothing. Number 3 suppose if there are three pirates C D and E C being senior most then C will make the following distribution. According to this distribution C gets 999 coins D gets 0 coin and e gets one coin 
see if there are three pirates pirate c needs one other person to vote for his plan the trick to this puzzle is understanding that if pirate c's plan is voted down he would die and then there would be only two pirates on the boat we already figured out what happened when there are only two pirates on the boat in the case of two pirates pirate e receives nothing so pirate c can simply offer pirate e a single gold coin and ensure his vote as a perfectly rational pirate knows one coin is better than no coins at all so now c will obviously vote in favor e knows that if c dies then d will make the next distribution and he will get nothing hence e will also vote in favor because they want to maximize their profit and the distribution is accepted because more than 50% is voted in favor that is two votes is compared to one vote so number 4 suppose if there are four pirates say b c d e b being senior most b will make the following distribution according to the distribution b gets 999 coins c gets zero coin d gets one coin and e gets zero coin if there were four pirates pirate b needs to convince one other person to guarantee 50% of the vote he could give pirate e two gold coins but his greed makes him realize that if his plan is destroyed there will only be three pirates on the boat when there are three pirates left pirate d knows he will get nothing so pirate b's buys pirate d's vote with one gold coin now b and d will vote in favor of this distribution because if the distribution is not accepted and b dies then c will have to make the distribution and d will get nothing you can see the distribution when there are three pirates hence because 50% pirates voted in favor of distribution it will be accepted finally if there are five pirates a b c d and e a being the senior a will make the following distribution according to the distribution a gets 998 coins b and d gets zero coin c and e gets one coin when there are five pirates pirate e needs two other associates he realizes that if he dies pirate c and pirate e will get zero coin so he offers each of them one gold coin and makes off with the other 998 gold coins by the same logic a c and e will vote in favor of distribution and hence the distribution will be accepted so this is the final distribution logic made by a this is how a distribute the coins so that he does not get killed and also gets the maximum coins possible see this question can be tweaked to confuse if you know the logic then any tweaks to the original puzzle can be analyzed in the right direction now if the question is asked for six pirates then you can answer similarly in fact we can find the solution for any number of pirates in the same puzzle suppose if there are 100 coins and 15 pirates how does the most senior pirate save his life and gets as much coins for himself as possible let me explain now so for a larger number a pattern looks like this and let's analyze the pattern if there were only one pirate he would keep all the gold for himself i have already explained the logic in the prior section if you have not understood it you can watch it again if there were two junior most pirates the senior one would keep all the gold for himself and his junior would have to agree because the senior sword would make 50% of the vote as discussed earlier if there were three pirates then the senior most of these the third pirate gets to make the decision he knows that if he is killed the junior most would get nothing so he gives one coin to him and gets his vote to make more than 50% vote that is he keeps 99 for himself and gives zero to the second one and gives one coin for the first one for four pirates case fourth pirate knows the situation earlier that is for three pirate case he knows that the best junior most writer can get one coin and the best second pirate can get a zero coins so if he gives just one coin to the second pirate then the second one would always agree so he keeps 99 for himself gives zero to third and first pirate and one coin to the second pirate this gets him 50% votes and he wins so now coming to the fifth pirate so he has his own vote on whatever decision he makes 
of course and needs two more oats he knows that in case of his death first and third would get nothing so he buys their oat by offering one coin each and keeps 98 for himself which means that to get the 50% oats the senior most pirate needs to give n minus 1 divided by two coins to his juniors where n is number of pirates so 15th pirate would get 100 minus 15 minus 1 divided by 2 which equals to 100 minus 7 is equal to 93 coins and from the pattern 14th pirate would not get any coin 13 11 9 7 5 3 and first pirate would get one coin each so this is how we have to identify the number of coins each will get for this kind of puzzles if the question is tweaked in any ways and if you know the logic you can answer this puzzle without any confusion let's look into one more difficult puzzle even though the logic required is same but it is little bit tricky so watch it very carefully so this is six pirates fight for one gold coin so here is the puzzle details six pirates discover a chest containing one gold coin they decide to sit down and devise a distribution strategy the pirates are ranked based on their experience pirate 1 2 pirate 6 where pirate 6 is the most experienced the most experienced pirate gets to propose a plan and then all the pirates vote on it if at least half of the pirates agree on the plan the gold is split according to the proposal if not the most experienced pirate is thrown off the ship and the process continues with the remaining pirates until a proposal is accepted the first priority of the pirates is to stay alive and second to maximize the gold they get pirate 6 devises a plan which he knows will keep him alive what is his plan so let's understand the solution the question is more complex version of five pirates fight for 1000 gold coins if you have not read through question please do so i am going to explain the solution assuming you know the other solution if there is only one pirate he takes the coin if there are two pirates pirate 2 takes the coin leaving pirate 1 with nothing in both the scenario it constitute more than 50% if there are three pirates pirate 3 needs one more vote there is no way we can convince pirate 2 since he benefits if pirate 3 dies pirate 3 gives the gold coin to pirate 1 to give his vote so he survives if there are four pirates pirate 4 needs one more vote he can't give it to pirate 1 since pirate 1 will get the gold coin even if pirate 4 dies he can give it to either to pirate 2 or 3 which will get him another vote to ensure his survival If there are five pirates, pirate five needs two more oats. There is no way he can get two more oats since there is only one gold coin to bribe with. Pirate five dies regardless of his approval. You can think about it. So think about the scenario when there are five pirates. So pirate five cannot make any kind of a plan in order to survive. With any approach, he will not get more than fifty percent oat. Anyway, he is going to die if there are five pirates left. So if there are six pirates pirate 6 needs two more oats he will surely get pirate 5's oat since pirate 5 will die if pirate 6 dies if pirate 6 and pirate 5 die pirate 4 will survive but will not get the gold coin so pirate 6 can bribe pirate 4 with a gold coin and gets his oat that makes a total of 3 oats allowing pirate 6 to survive he can also give the gold coin to pirate 1 2 or 3 although giving it to pirate 2 or 3 is a little confusing since either of them could get the gold coin in the case of four pirates so this is how we have to think when solving this kind of puzzle this is how your approach should be you have to go from top down approach so that you can actually deduce the logic in order to solve this kind of puzzles